An important warning, we're experiencing a once in a lifetime convergence where three scaling laws are compounding simultaneously. Pre-training, post-training, and inference are all going exponential at once. Joining me now to discuss is Wedbush's Dan Ives. So Dan, you know, Nvidia's numbers really cap an earnings season where these companies pretty much did everything they were expected to do and more. Um, you know, recommitting to the AI trade, essentially saying that uh, they're still uh, enthusiastic about it. Why is the market in general not really giving them credit for it? Well, first, I think that was a masterpiece quarter, right? And I think any worries about the AI bubble thrown out the window in terms of fundamentally when you heard from Godfather of AI, Jens NVIDIA. Look, I think it speaks, and you've talked about it a lot on the show, like, worries about circular financing, yeah. like where this is going to go. Can the data centers going to build, get built? Is there a capacity issues? Look, I just continue to view when you put the pieces together of the puzzle, as well as, you know, our, you know, three weeks in Asia, this is third inning, top of the third, one out of this AI game. And that's why I just think name, like, names like NVIDIA, days like today, you buy names like Oracle, Microsoft, NVIDIA. Because I believe this tech bull market has another two years left. I mean, as a baseball numbers guy, you know, they now, we now know sometimes the third inning is your high leverage inning, where you got to kind of bring in the, the best arms and try to put down a threat. Uh, and I'm wondering right now if, if NVIDIA's numbers, and I've been kind of puzzling over this all day, as great as they are and as much confidence as Jensen has about the next four or five quarters, you wonder if everybody can have equal confidence in the customers that are giving him all that money and allowing him to earn those margins on, on their spend and when they're going to sort of uh, get clarity about the payback. Look, it's a great point. But I would just say, look, in the U.S., 3% of companies have gone down the AI path. Europe, zero. You look at, you know, in Asia, X china minimal, less than 1%. Sovereigns, Middle East just started. I mean, my whole point is that, you know, right now, demand the supply is 12 to 1 for NVIDIA chips. And of course, AMD and others are yeah. going to play. But the reality is that we are still early. I mean, you're talking more money is going to be spent in the next two to three years than the last eight, 10 years combined. So I get some of the worries, but I believe the bears will continue to watch this AI party from the outside looking in as they continue to prove it out. And I think streets underestimate numbers anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. Right. Next but, but is that months. not the bull case for NVIDIA and the whole food chain for the infrastructure build out? Can it not also be the bear case for the metas of the world and the Microsofts that feel like they're on this unending treadmill of having to spend hoping that they get the return. Yeah, and I think, but I, I do think it's a little more than hope because yeah. the reality is that the use cases, if you almost put the piece together, look at Palantir, mm -hmm. look at MongoDB, look at Snowflake. So you see the use cases are exploding. Look, and it's an arms race that yeah. they are having to continue to spend on. And you're gonna see the same in the Oracle. But I think Meta, we look out 12 to 18 months. This was a table pounder moment, just like right. we saw with Alphabet as a table pounder. Well, I was gonna get to Alphabet because that's a really fascinating situation, how it's gotten revalued higher, tremendous amount of sponsorship all of a sudden of this name that people really had a lot of skepticism about not that long ago. Now, their new model is getting raves, I guess, in terms of its performance, the new Gemini. Uh, and also, they did it, you know, kind of with their own processors. So how does that play into the whole, you know, NVIDIA at the center of this question? Sure. Well, look, NVIDIA obviously fueling its centerpiece in terms of one chip in the yeah. world. But the reality is Alphabet, you go back six, eight months ago, New York City cab drivers bearish on it, right? So it's one AI that is ultimately going to destruct the model. The opposites happen. I mean, I think now you see Sundar and, and what's happening at Google, they're on the offensive. I mean, you look at what they've done with Gemini. This is just the start because the reality is in Cupertino for Apple, who are they going in for AI? It's just a matter of time until they do the Google Gemini deal as well. Yeah. So that's why you've seen that stock at continue re-rating. Full case, four hundred hours. You know, my, my colleague Scott Dev and I, we've done a lot of work. Look, I believe this is one. This is a name you continue to own, just still early days. And then when it comes to Apple, because you mentioned it's an arms race, well, they're not really participating, at least in terms of the gross dollars being funneled in that direction. Yeah, I think yet. Yeah, I think now it comes down to like obviously iPhone 17 has been almost a sleeper upgrade cycle. 
but you have the biggest install base in the world. Monetization is right now on the verge. 2.4 billion iOS devices, 1.5 billion iPhones. The consumer AI revolution will go through Apple and Cook, mm -hmm. but it all comes down to Gemini. And now that DOJ that that has cleared, mm -hmm. that gives them the opportunity to walk down the aisle and ultimately ink that partnership. We said that's worth $75 to $100 for Apple stock. That's why I continue to view that as just a must own name mm -hmm. here. Wall Street is underestimating AI earnings by 15 to 20% because they don't understand that inference now requires massive computation as AIs read and think before answering. Dan Ives declares the street is underestimating numbers across AI infrastructure companies. Jensen reveals the mechanism. Three scaling laws are happening at the same time. This is the once in a lifetime event most investors are missing. It's not just that AI is improving, it's that three separate exponential curves are compounding simultaneously in ways that haven't happened before in computing history. Each scaling law alone would drive massive infrastructure demand. All three happening at once creates computational requirements that grow faster than anyone's anticipated. Pre-training scaling was the first wave everyone understood. Bigger models with more parameters trained on more data consistently produced better results. That was the GPT-3 to GPT-4 leap. Companies could predict, double the compute, get measurably better model performance. Analysts modeled that growth curve and thought they understood AI infrastructure needs. But post-training scaling changed the game. It turns out you can take a trained model and make it dramatically smarter by applying more compute during the fine-tuning phase. The model learns to break problems into steps, reason through complex scenarios, and solve tasks it couldn't handle before. Its capability jumps from the same base model just by adding post-training compute. The more compute you apply to a model, the smarter it is, Insight is profound. This doesn't appear to be diminishing returns. It's consistent returns on computational investment even after the model is trained. That breaks the traditional software economics where development costs are fixed and marginal costs approach zero. With AI, you can keep investing compute to make the product even better after shipping. And then inference scaling compounds everything. Traditional inference was cheap. Run the model once, get an answer, Done. But reasoning models using chain of thought don't work that way. They generate internal reasoning steps, explore multiple solution paths, backtrack when approaches fail, synthesize findings, and in Jensen's description, AIs are reading and thinking before it answers. And this captures why compute demand is exploding. A simple query that used to require one forward pass through a model now might require dozens or hundreds of internal reasoning steps before producing the final answer. That's not two times or five times more compute. Often it's 50 to 100 more compute per query. And users prefer these reasoning models because the answers are dramatically better. So adoption accelerates despite higher costs. When you have three exponential curves compounding, better base models requiring more training compute, those models getting smarter with more post-training compute, and inference requiring vastly more compute per query, the total computational demand doesn't just add up, it multiplies. That's why Jensen keeps emphasizing this isn't linear growth. Wall Street analysts see AI infrastructure spending and try to model when it peaks or plateaus. They're using frameworks from previous technology cycles where initial deployment is expensive, but then costs decline as you scale. AI appears to be working in an opposite direction. As models get better, they justify more infrastructure investment because the capabilities unlock higher value use cases requiring even more compute. This compounds across the entire value chain. Nvidia isn't just selling GPUs for training anymore. They're selling for training, post-training, and increasingly compute intensive inference. Cloud providers aren't just scaling data centers linearly, they need exponential capacity growth to handle reasoning workloads. Software companies aren't just improving existing products, they're rebuilding them around reasoning capabilities that require completely different infrastructure. But the exponential compute demand isn't just about scale, it's about a fundamental shift in how computing works. Computing is shifting from retrieval-based, accessing pre-created content, to generative, creating unique content in real time for every request. That requires AI factories all over the world to generate software on demand rather than just storing and retrieving it. This is why Dan Ives' productivity miracle is intact thesis is actually understated. We're not just making existing computing more efficient, we're replacing the entire architecture of how computing works. 
the economic implications are vastly larger than productivity improvements suggest. Retrieval-based computing dominated for 50 plus years because it made economic sense. Creating content is expensive, so you create it once, store it, and serve it to millions of users. YouTube videos, database records, web pages, even dynamic content was just selecting from pre-made options. The infrastructure is built around storing massive amounts of data and retrieving it quickly. That's what databases optimize for. Generative AI breaks this model completely. Every interaction produces unique content that never existed before and will never exist again in exactly that form. When you ask ChatGPT a question, it's not retrieving a pre-written answer, it's generating a response specifically for your query in your context at that moment. The next person asking a similar question gets different content generated from scratch. This seems like a subtle difference, but the infrastructure implications are massive. Retrieval scales beautifully. Create once, serve millions, marginal costs approach zero. Generation, on the other hand, scales terribly. Every request requires computation, marginal costs stay significant. That's why you need AI factories all over the world. You can't centralize generation the way you can centralize storage and retrieval. So the AI factory framing captures the economic reality. These aren't just data centers, they're production facilities that manufacture intelligence on demand. Just like physical factories consume raw materials and energy to produce goods, AI factories consume electricity and data to produce tokens, responses, images, and code. The factory analogy helps people understand this is manufacturing, not just information technology. The global factory distribution requirement creates new economic dynamics. You can't serve the world from mega data centers in Virginia or Oregon anymore. Latency matters too much for generation. Users expect instant responses, so you need AI factories regionally distributed to minimize generation time. That drives infrastructure build out globally in ways cloud computing didn't require. This also explains why AI infrastructure spending seems so high relative to current revenue. Under retrieval models, you could overbuild capacity and amortize costs across growing user bases. Under generative models, you need capacity proportional to usage. There's no more building once, scale uses infinitely. More users means proportionally more generation capacity needed. The last paradigm shift of this magnitude was probably the move from mainframes to client server computing, or maybe the introduction of the internet itself. Both took decades to fully play out and created trillions in value for companies that understood the shift early. This generative computing paradigm is the scale of change and it's happening compressed in years rather than decades. Most people pour money into ads people ignore. YouTube changes that, it builds trust, authority, and a real connection at scale. One law firm we worked with landed 33 clients in just five months worth $330,000 from their YouTube channel. If you run a business, this is one of the most overlooked opportunities right now. Book a call with me below and I can show you how we can make it happen.